Okay, cool. So after that, it's pretty much straightforward. So now we uh, do chapter 30. Biot-Savart law is the first law we're going to see, and Ampere's law, and then we're going to talk about uh, what's known as displacement current. Uh, in this chapter, what we're interested in is how is a magnetic field created? And we're going to be doing integration. We haven't been doing integration for a while, so I miss it a lot. You know, so time to go back to integrals. Okay. Now, if you remember, let me again go back to what we did in the past, so that you can see the connection. If you remember when we talked about chapter twenty-three and chapter twenty-four. So this is way back when we first started the semester. Here are some of the things that we began with. We said when, we, when you have the uh, two charges, let's say they're negative, they're opposite charge, or they're equal, uh, uh, they're, they, they could either be both positive, or they could either be both negative, or they could be opposite charge. What do they do to each other? They attract or they repel each other, right? So the first thing we talked about is k q1 q2 over r squared. So the force of attraction or force of repulsion is equal to that. The next thing we did is we said, what if you just have one charge by itself? Does it do something? And the answer was, yeah, it creates a certain um, influence around it. We call that the electric field. And because of that influence, if you put another charge there, it experiences a force. So that uh, the electric field of a single charge, we said the electric field of a single charge is kq over r squared, if it's like a point charge, right? The next thing we said is if you have a bunch of these single charges, right? Let's say I have a bunch of distribution of uh, charges. And let's say I want to know the, the electric field at some arbitrary position. And let's say there's no charge there. But I just want to know what's the total electric field due to these three over there. OK? Then what do I do? Well, if, they're each, if in each individual charge is a point charge, then I simply take the electric field of each one. So this is the electric field created by the, this charge. This is the electric field created by this charge. This is the electric field created by that charge. And now I have to add that, because, but there, since they're vectors, it's not that easy. You have to break them up into components and stuff. Uh, so that's the next thing we did. So we said, if you have a bunch of single point charges, the total sum of the electric fields is the vector sum of each individual electric field, right? Then the next thing we did is we said, what if you have a charge distribution that's not a point charge? You know? So let's say you have a, uh, you have a rod. Can I find the electric field at the center or at the edge or somewhere or the end right here? So I'm trying to remind you of these because it's been a while. Then what we noticed is the only points that are doable, integrable, is the center and the end. The other ones have become very tough. And remember uh, how we did it. We took a, we used symmetry for the center. We said this one, this one, they cancel, they cancel, and then they give an electric field like that. Over here, we didn't really need to use symmetry because all the electric fields add up. Okay. So basically what you do is you argue the electric field of a single individual little piece is equal to that, then you integrate it. Okay? So to do the center one, you have to first use symmetry and argue that the x components cancel and then their y components survive. For the end one, you don't need that. You don't need to do that. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> then the next thing we said is uh, if there is a point charge there, let's say, I, let's say now I place a point charge there. 
And w now I want to know what's the force between these two. Okay? Well, once you find the total electric field there, then the force on that charge is what? QE. Right? So in other words, it's very easy to find the force once you know the E. The E is the hard one. Right? Once you know the E, that's it. All you do is just QE. Same thing over here, back here. If, if I put a point charge here and I want to know the force on it, well, all I have to do is find the total E there by adding this sum. And then once I get the E, I just do QE. So for electric fields, finding the force is easy. You just do QE. But the E is the hard one. Okay. Um, then the next thing we did is we transitioned into chapter 24. And we, we uh, discussed about electric flux and uh, Gauss's law. And we said there are certain cases where it's easier to find the electric field using Gauss's law. So let's, let's take a sphere, for example. If I want to find the electric field at a certain distance away from a sphere, if I had to do it with this method, I would have to take a ring And I would have to find the electric field uh, of a ring, right? And then I would have to integrate over all the rings. I would have to integrate over all the rings to find the electric field there. But the Gauss's law approach is uh, more a global approach, kind of. The Gauss's law approach is if you see some kind of symmetry in the problem, then don't do the superposition method. The Gauss's law approach says, if, there is a, if there's a spherical symmetry here, right, there's only one charge and it's a sphere. So that means the electric field equidistant from the sphere is all the same, right? So you integrate you integrate over the whole sphere and since the electric field over here is the same as here, here is the same as there, here is the same as there, here is the same. So all around it's the same. So this integral just becomes e times 4 pi r squared. And then this one goes down, and it just becomes kq over r squared, right? So in other words, the whole point of using Gauss's law is that when you do this integral, it really is not an integral. It just becomes e four, 4 pi r squared, OK? Then what, we, what did we do next? Anyone remember? We went inside of the sphere, right? I know it's been like a couple of months, so you forgot. But it's good to review this, not just because, oh, OK, we need to know it eventually for the final, but uh, it's always a good idea to uh, review the past so you can make connections with the present, especially when there are connections, and also to get a big picture of what you've learned during the semester, you know? Like imagine you go to a museum and you see this big piece of uh, artwork, you know, Michelangelo or whatever. And imagine if you went, re you, you first saw the Michelangelo picture from the, uh, you know, far, and you say, wow, what a beautiful picture, right? And then you went up close to the picture just to get a look at more detail, you know. Oh, you, you go up close, you see how he's painted the face and how he's painted the nose and the eye of this particular individual in the picture. And you say, wow, what, what handiwork, you know, it's crafts, craftsmanship and just really beautiful picture. And then you just kind of walk away and you forget the whole bigger picture, you know. Well, all you remember is that little detail. So what I want you to kind of